All right, hello and welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Willie Mandrell, who is over in Boston, Massachusetts. How are you doing, Willie? I'm doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. And I'm um, excited to talk to Willie today. He's a self-made uh, multimillionaire real estate investor, broker, coach, lecturer, and author. And we'll just talk about real real estate investing. And I guess the, the, the starting point, Willie, is, uh, I mean, right now, the, the, the real estate market is really hot, particularly on the residential side, right? I mean, there's low, there's low inventory, there's high demand, everything's getting, uh, everything's getting bid upwards. Uh, the new construction is, is, is down. Um, as we talked just before we came on, on air, you know, inflation, price of lumber, all of that stuff is going up. So for, for people who are thinking about getting into real estate investing, on the surface, this wouldn't seem like a particularly good time. But is it actually? Um, it's always a good time, in my opinion. There's always there's mm-hmm. always a, a benefit, um, is so to speak, right? So um, you know, right now, you're right. There, we're living in inflationary times, but real estate is the best hedge against inflation. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, if you're if you're thinking about sitting on the sidelines, you know, prices are only going up right now, and you know, to get in to own, um, you're going to be able to capture some of that appreciation. Um, you know, and even when you have markets that are, you know, working in the opposite, you know, uh, opposite direction, um, I find that when people are running away from the market, you have something, you know, different that you're like, you mentioned, they're running towards the market right now. If they're running away from the market, we as humans still need a place to live. We still need a roof over our head. So if you're running away from the market, then what are you doing? You're renting. And if I'm the one who owns the rentals, then my rentals are, are, are in high demand and my rental prices are going up. So in my opinion, there's a, you know, there's always going to be, uh, you know, pluses to owning land. Um, you know, I've said this, you know, a hundred times uh, when I was in school and please don't quote me on these numbers. I want to say there was 6 billion people on the planet. You know, that was the number I remember, you know, hearing mm-hmm. in school, there's closer to 7 billion people or more on the planet now. And the earth hasn't gotten any bigger. The pop, you know, the, 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 the land that we have on this planet hasn't, hasn't expanded in any way. The land in Boston, the land in San Diego is mm-hmm. not, you know, we can't create any more. So those of us who own it um, are going to see, you know, the benefits of either the rental prices going up or the, the value of that land through appreciation going up. So um, my personal opinion is if you can get in, uh, get in, do what you can to get in, straight, crawl, you know, borrow, do what you need to do, but get yourself in. Real estate's a great place to be. Yeah, because I've seen a, a number of, uh, uh, you know, experts recently, like, arguing over whether we're in a, a bubble or not. I mean, some are arguing that we're not because there's there's not too much leverage or too much capital, um, but other people are saying we are. Where, where do you think we are right now? For me, and again, I'm going to give you kind of an answer yeah. that most people probably no, no, don't, don't want to hear or don't expect. <laughs> For me, it doesn't really matter. Because right. it depends on your timeline. If you're if, for two things to answer your question, one is the bubble matters if you're speculating. If you're jumping into real estate just to capture appreciation over the next couple of years, you're a speculator. You're not an investor, right? Then you're then you're worried about whether we're in a bubble or not. If I were this case, I would probably stay out of the market. I wouldn't encourage you to speculate. An investor like myself is somebody who's going in and saying this property today is renting out, let's say it's, you know, mortgage, taxes, insurance, principal, trash, water, sewer is going to cost me $3,000 a month. The two rentals are going to cost me or produce income of $4,000 a month. So I'm going to be making $1,000 a month. If the market takes a 10% dip, my rentals are not going to take a 10% dip. If anything, my renters are, we've just talked about that. The rentals are going to go back up. So I'm still producing cash regardless of what the market does. That's what an investor does, not a speculator. So for me, the, my business model, the buy and hold rental, uh, you know, multifamily business, I'm not too concerned. The other thing, the only other reason I would, the only caveat I would put to that is if I'm closer to my retirement age and I don't, you, you know, like I said, the traditional American retirement age, 65 or whatever it is, um, you can say, hey, I'm going to work to 80 or you can say, hey, I'm going to be with somebody who is retiring at 45. If you're close to the age that you want to retire, I would probably stay out of the market if that's the case. I would be a little bit more conservative. But for me, I'm 38 today. Um, I've lived yeah. through, I was an investor in 2008 when the last, when the, when the housing market crashed prior, I will probably see several more recessions and pullbacks. So for me, 
I have a roughly a 20 year timeline, um, you know, or maybe a little bit, little bit less, a little bit more. Um, so for me, I'm not too worried about it. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to, you know, hold on, you know, for those, uh, those downturns and buy more during the downturn and, 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 you know, continue to ride that wave up. Uh, and do you say it was your, your birthday today? No, no, it's not my birthday. Oh, okay. uh, no, it's not my birthday. Said you were 30, <laughs> 30, so you said you were thirty-eight today. Um, so no, no, let me thir- ask you, yeah. Let, let me ask you. Let me ask you another question, right? So, I mean, I love that the speculate um, versus invest because I think for for the the casual observers out there, that's probably a, a very good distinction because let's face it, they've been bombarded over the last number of years with flipping houses and making quick money and all of that. But that's not really, you know, that's a different type, as you said. That's speculating as opposed to real estate investing. Um, the other thing is um, multifamily versus residential versus commercial real estate. Uh, which of those would you focus on? Um, for me, you know, I would say small multifamily. And when I say that, when I say small multifamily, I mean two, three, four units. Uh, above right. four units, you're getting into uh, commercial, you know, they describe it as multifamily, but it's commercial real estate. Anything above that, um, you're not going for a residential loan. If you're new to the business, um, I would stay away from the reason I, I've been in the business for 15 years and I still buy small residential multifamily uh, properties. And the reason I stay away from the larger stuff is because the larger stuff tends to be, and this may sound horrible, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> they tend to have savvier brokers and they tend to have savvier investors who are owning, they trade on cap rate, they trade on return on investment. There's, there are more metrics involved that are, are not going to let you get as good of a deal. I find that in a smaller residential space, the two family, three family, four family, I can achieve more uh, appreciation. I can achieve a, more of a, uh, uh, an op- there's more of an opportunity for me to go into something with equity on the front end from a distressed homeowner, from a distressed, uh, uh, you know, uh, owner in a distressed situation or distressed piece of property, uh, somebody who's getting foreclosed on, somebody who is going through the middle of divorce, somebody who inherited a property that they just don't want, that tends to be more likely, a more likely scenario on the smaller residential side than it does to be on the much larger, uh, you know, multifamily side. Um, it also takes a lot, there's a larger barrier to entry to get into the mul- larger multifamily, um, more capital, you have to know people, um, you have to go out there and learn how to raise private money. Um, with the smaller stuff, you can get in, um, but it depends, you know, you live in, you know, you're in San Diego, I'm in Boston, we live in two very high price markets. Um, and you may need, you know, even partners just to get into Boston. I mean, our typical three family at this point is, uh, you know, a million two. Um, and that's entry level. So, I mean, it's just uh, you, you just uh, even with an FHA loan, three and a half percent down, um, you know, it's still quite a, you know, quite a bit of money just to get yourself in. No, no, absolutely. And then obviously on the on the on the bigger commercial side, I mean, we have to see how everything is going to shake out after the pandemic, given the. Right given the, you know, people, maybe companies are downsizing their footprints now that they've got used to maybe having people working virtually. You know? So we haven't really seen the full impact of that. I did read somewhere that in some places like in, in Asia, they're sort of getting back towards full capacity in buildings. But I mean, that's not certainly the case here. And I guess we've got to wait and see how that's going to play out. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. Uh, Boston's a very large college town. Harvard is here. MIT is here. Northeastern, BU, BC, um, what, what are uh, the economics here in our rental market has a lot to do with what our colleges end up doing, right? Um, mm-hmm. Do they go back to full capacity? Are they, are they requiring students to be on campus? The thing that, I, the thing that encourages me is that most people, um, and maybe, you, you, maybe some of your listeners have heard this before, is McDonald's is not in the business of selling hamburgers, right? McDonald's yeah. is in the real estate business. McDonald's has some of the most prestigious real estate around the world, and they, they make more money. Their assets on their books are not the, the fryer later. It's the actual real <laughs> estate, right? Northeastern University, Harvard University, MIT operate a lot like McDonald's. They own some of the most prestigious real estate here in Boston, Cambridge, uh, and, and you know a- along the Charles River, uh, Beacon Hill, some of the most prestigious neighborhoods. What's encouraging to me is if they 
say, hey, everybody can go virtual now. Everybody, you know, can then their real estate portfolio takes a hit. And I do not think uh, that they want their real estate <laughs> portfolio to take a hit. So I, I believe that they will be pushing for students to be back on campus. And there'll be a sales pitch that online learning is not as effective as on campus learning because they want their uh, they, they, they want to make sure that their real estate you know, you know, portfolio does not take as much of a hit as well. So that directly that has that that's that that you know that trickle effect you drop the pedal in the pond and do, though I do not own you know uh you know dormitories on you know in Cambridge right. um what they do directly affects me as that that ripple effect you know comes out into the rest of Boston well for sure yeah obviously if they fill up then uh, then the, the the demand moves elsewhere let's just Absolutely. talk about are you are you seeing this there, there's some talk about nowadays about um, especially, you know, younger people uh, not jumping into owning houses uh, maybe as quickly as they did once upon a time because they want to stay mobile or they want to. So are you seeing that there's actually, a, you know, an increase in the opportunity for rental properties because of changing behavior or is or do you have you not noticed anything discernible there? No, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I see it, you know, all the time. I'm in uh, in old spirit, you know, compared to, you know, my generation. Um I'm technically, I'm, I guess I'm 38. I'm technically a millennial. I describe myself as like the millennial's big brother because um, I, I, I relate in some respects, but you know, in some respect, you know, I, I, I don't. Um, but yeah, I do see that that trend. Um, I, it's, I call it the 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 Tim Ferriss effect. If you've ever read the Four Hour Work Week, um, you know, Tim Ferriss is the author, and he he, you know, is in that believer of you know staying mobile and you know, enjoying life and, you know, the many vacations and being able to travel around and work here and work there. And I, and I get that, you know, I mean, that's, you know, it's a, you know, a change from the 1950s where it was like, you immediately get the GM job. Uh, you go to work for Ford, you buy a house and you stay there and you pay off your mortgage in 30 years. Um, so there's definitely a, you know, a, you know, a, a, a shift there. Um, whether it's sustainable, I'm, I'm not really sure, but, you know, for me, um, I'm somewhere in between, you know, I, I, I believe that, like I mentioned before, I don't see a, a tech solution. I don't see Elon Musk creating something that's going to rid of us, rid us of the need for housing, right? We're still going to need a roof over our head, um, you know, long term. So we need, we need a place to sleep. We need a place to shit. We need a place to, you know, hang our clothes and everything else. If so, if that's the case, I think in my lifetime, you know, uh, I'm going to continue to buy real estate and bank on the fact that I'll be able to uh, rent that to somebody else who wants to travel around the world when they need a place to stay at the end of the day, I'll be the one that they, uh, they, they pay that to. So, um, I, I do see that trend. I just don't know. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a real wealth building, uh, strategy around that though. Mm -hmm. Although I guess there, the one part of it is that maybe it might be easier to, to buy and rent out properties in less traditional places than before. Uh, you know, because I mean, there's a move to, I see there's, there's even uh, states and cities who are now offering incentives for people to move to to their area and stuff. So maybe so maybe outside of, you know, the more traditional markets, some of them more non some of them non traditional markets might actually be good places for first time investors. That's true. That, that is absolutely true. There's a lot of cities, uh, you know, Austin, Texas is one, of you know, a growing, growing city, um, millennial population. Um, there's a lot of a lot of places that weren't traditionally um, you know, hubs are now becoming hubs, you know, I mean, cheaper, you know, cheaper housing, easier living, uh, less expensive. Boston, you know, like San Diego is a very expensive place to live. So mm -hmm. I can understand um, the migration to, uh, you know, other places. So. Yeah. And in terms of uh, if you're getting into real estate investing for the first time, I mean, there's obviously you could invest in you could find somewhere in your local area and all of that. But, uh, you know, some people would encourage you to go like nationwide and, and find properties. What, what what do you advise people or do you say if you're going to go nationwide, you have to have at least some level of sophistication to do that? I, I think so. No, I know. I don't, I don't I don't think you need a, a level of sophistication. I think whatever you do. I, I don't think that you should have a, you know, you should be investing in two families in San Diego and have one in Boston and have one in Chicago. I think that if you live in Boston and you want to invest in Chicago, you can certainly do that. If you live in San Diego and you want to invest in Tennessee, you can certainly do that. But I'm a big believer in establishing a niche. If you live in San Diego and you want to make your niche single family homes in Tennessee, absolutely. But I don't think you should buy one single family home in Tennessee and then jump to Dallas, Texas. They're not the same markets, right? They're, you, I think if you really want to build wealth and if you really want to, and it's not just building wealth, it's, I think in any industry, 
you have to like the medical field or anything like my, uh, you know, my wife and my, my, my sister-in-law are in the medical field. And I think, and this is just, I don't know their actual salaries, but my general MD, my primary care doctor makes less than the gentleman who did my knee surgery. The gentleman who did my knee surgery is a specialist. He's a lower yeah. extremity specialist. Um, and I think that like that medical field, you in real estate or you in any type of uh, you know professional environment need to establish a niche for yourself. So if you want to be the guy in San Diego who invests in uh, Tennessee single families, you can certainly do that. But I would encourage you to learn the Tennessee market. And within the Tennessee market, learn your specific niche, um, the, the, the specific pockets uh, within you know, uh, Memphis or whatever you know, city that you're in. Um, learn what streets you should be on, what streets you should not be on. Learn your tenant base. Learn the expectations of your tenant base. Are you overbuilding? Are you underbuilding? What is the vacancy rate that's typical? There's so much to learn that you really can't be bouncing around from city to city. Here in Boston, we have about 20 different neighborhoods. I only invest in three. I only invest in three, and I only invest in three, three family, three and four unit uh, buildings within three specific neighborhoods of Boston. Um, and then within those three specific neighborhoods, we have about seven different zip codes, and I only invest in about five of those different <laughs> you know, zip codes. So that's where the real money is made and the nuance and the, and the details and the nitty gritty. And you really can't do that if you're bouncing around all over the country. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic advice for people is to figure out where you want to invest and then do your homework and do your research and see whether that's the right place. But I, I think it's great. I think focus is always good. And particularly if you're going to get into something like this, uh, there's a lot of variables. Uh, there's a lot of variables that come into play. So I think uh, focusing on a niche is is really good idea. So um, just in finishing, uh, Willie, are there any are there any non-traditional real estate or, or overlooked real estate investments that people should maybe consider? Oh, that's a good question. I don't, I think I would, overlooked real estate investments that people should consider. Um, I am, I think people have a real fear for, um, uh, I would say housing vouchers. You can, they call them different things all over the country, housing vouchers, section eight, um, you know, uh, you know, tenants with, with housing vouchers. I think there's a, there's a real, um, misunderstanding for that population that if I have a voucher, I'm considered a bad tenant. If I have a voucher, I'm going to mess up your, your, your place. I have made an absolute killing catering to the Section 8 housing uh, voucher uh, market in my particular neighborhood. And I can tell you why. I can tell you we're coming off of a pandemic right now. Last 15 months mm -hmm. have been absolutely horrible. Uh, and for some for some landlords. So for for instance, here in Boston, we have a lot of, you know, very, like I said, I mentioned pr prestigious, you know, buildings, landlords who are selling out at 15 years or uh, 15 months into the pandemic because the student population hasn't yet come back as strong as it as is expected. Um, for me, I never really took a hit. I had a couple tenants who owed me, you know, uh, you know, a few months behind. But for the most part, 85 percent of my 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 portfolio or my rents being collected every month are paid for by the city of Boston in some way or some other government backed entity. So um, the pandemic was not as much of a, uh, I wouldn't say a big deal because I mean, it uh, affected my life in so many different sure. ways, but <laughs> in terms of my real estate portfolio uh, and the financials, I had less of an impact than some of the, someone who is uh, catering to luxury, catering to uh, the student population. So for me, I think, uh, there's a lot of people in a lot of different cities who could be making, uh, you know, a, a good living, um, understanding the Section 8 housing voucher market um, and the, um, you know, the nuances that come with it. There are some some good, some bad, um, but I think that's a niche that not enough people pay attention to. Yeah, listen, fantastic. That's a great piece of advice. Uh for people to investigate. Hey, listen, Willie, this has been fantastic. All of Willie's information is going to be below this video. Uh, but before we go, please just spend a moment, tell people a little bit more about yourself and what your company does. Yeah, sure. Um, real estate investor for the last 15 years. Um, right now, my company is a, a local Boston real estate development company. We buy, renovate and uh, rent and hold on to multifamilies here. I also do a little bit of coaching and have a book uh, out on Amazon right now called Cash Flow Secrets. And if you're interested in uh, learning how to get in, how to finance, how to manage, uh, and all the secrets that come with kind of learning the, uh, the beginning stages of multifamily, uh, definitely check it out. It's Cash Flow Secrets on Amazon.
Fantastic. Yeah, and that book will be uh, in the links below as well. So thank you, really. And thank you for watching and listening. John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM, where we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Yeah.